This time in the Magic Kitchen, we're joined by author Linda Radish for a holiday special episode on the secret history of Christmas baking. I'm Leandra Witchwood. And I'm Elise Wells. And welcome to the Magic Kitchen podcast, where we talk about magic, kitchen witchcraft, herbs, and everything in between. Kitchen Podcast is funded and supported by the witchwoodteahouse.com, offering a variety of hand blended loose leaf teas as well as loose herbs for all of your ritual, spell work, wellness, and everyday enjoyment needs. If you would like to support this podcast while sipping a great cup of tea, head over to the witchwoodteahouse.com and find the magic that's in store for you. Welcome. Linda Radish has been contributing crafts, recipes, and ethnobotanical lore to Llewellyn's Herbal Almanac since 2012. Outside the kitchen, she has special interests in needlework, minority languages, and exploring the suburban jungle. You can follow her culinary, crafting, and linguistic adventures at Instagram at Linda Radish. So welcome, Linda. We're really excited to have you here yeah. as a Magic Kitchen podcast. You know, it's great to have a <laughs> a kitchen themed episode. Absolutely. Yeah. And I am happy to be in the Magic Kitchen. It sounds a little bit like the Magic Garden, which oh, dates yeah. me that I watched yeah. the Magic Garden as a kid. Oh, wow. Very cool. <laughs> It'd be a good sister podcast for us, honestly. I know, right? The Magic <laughs> yeah, the Magic Garden. Oh, I would love that. Yeah, I would love to get into the, you know, the different gardens of occult herbalism. That that's something that. <laughs> well, the the, yeah. the magic garden on magic garden on TV had. I don't think any of the flowers were real. It was a, oh. a kids show on public television, and um, yeah, there was a fake tree with a fake squirrel in it and fake sunflowers. <laughs> but I loved it. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> I gotta I gotta look that up and see if like maybe YouTube has some throwbacks in that. I gotta look it up. I now. bet they do. Yeah. <laughs> So your newest book, The Secret History of Christmas Baking, I loved it. I Mm -hmm. picked it up the night before, like, you know, the night before I ended up reading it in one day. So I picked it up and I was like, oh, I thought you you meant last night. And then, (laughs) oh, no, no, no. I read it last last week or the week before and I ended up reading it in a single day which I wouldn't have predicted because if you pick this thing up it's 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 got a lot going on Mm -hmm. and it's a lot to review so I I literally I read it and then I went back through with some post-its and read it again because I wanted to really chart the history yeah I really loved it Linda like I my passion is the history of tradition of occult Mm -hmm. practices, of witchcraft, and really like the folklore behind things. So when I was reading your book, so many things clicked into place. Like I really needed that first read to just like explore that. And then I was like, okay, let's really write this down so I don't forget these connections because it was just, there's a lot, there's a lot in here. There's a lot. Yeah. It's a really great book. I, I have somebody in mind that is going to get a copy of this for Yule because she absolutely loves to bake. So I think this is right up her alley. <laughs> That's good news to me. If yeah. I actually, if I had had my way, I would have had very few to no recipes ah. in it um, because that's what, you know, I like to bake. Yeah. I don't love to bake, um, but like I can, I've always been able to. And when you write one book with recipes in it, every book after that also has to have recipes in it (laughs) and um so you know I don't have a degree and so I can't and I couldn't actually go to all the places if I could have written it as a travel thing where I'm actually going um make it that kind of book I can't afford to do that but I'm I was like okay I can bake I want to know all this history. I love doing the research. So I have to write it as a baking book. So that's what we've got. Well, I think, but I will say 
Yeah, it works. And it comes across that way because I'm not a baker. In fact, I do not have an oven. I live in Greece and oh. Greek living is very rudimentary. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't have a clothes dryer. We don't have a dishwasher. We don't have a ice maker. We don't have, I mean, there's just so much we, we don't have, which I have gotten very used to, but I don't have an oven. So baking is one of those things. Like it's still kind of traditional here to go to the bakery with your casserole thing and be like, can you bake this for me? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. My, my mother said, I think it was, I don't know if it was just because that's how it was in the forties or if it was a war thing, but when she was growing up in Germany, they lived in a city and you would, it was probably largely a war thing. Um, You know, okay. So you put your cake together and then you go down to the bakery and he'll put, he's not going to put yours in alone. He's going to put like 10 and, and bake them to cut down on fuel consumption. So yeah, yeah, that's, and in the middle ages, that was, yeah, nobody had, nobody in London had, had their own oven. That's, that's crazy. So you would Mm -hmm. bring it to the bake shop. And that's so communal. I love that because you have to connect with your community to do that. And I think that's a great remembrance for, you know, when we are feeling disconnected, like how can we connect with each other? Like go to a friend's house, bake some cakes, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, well, um, and pickling think- too is it pickling is still here like a communal um I have a friend my, my son and I make kimchi together the mm. um Korean Aww. um mm. yeah. fermented cabbage yeah. but I have another friend who uh she you know her it's her grandmother and her sister and this whole thing and they make batches and batches of kimchi mm. I have another friend who we've gone over there to make achar which is um there's just the Nepali version. We did radishes, corn, garlic, mm. I have carrots, cauliflower, and somebody had already mixed the spices, so I don't even know what all was in there. And, you know, it's assembly line, and you make the achar, and everybody goes home with a couple jars of achar. That's really cool. Yeah. 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 I was thinking of canning in particular yeah. when you said about the that communal, too, because that's actually... Mm-hmm. And I have to make a shout out again to your book here in this. I grew up Pennsylvania Dutch in like Amish country, Pennsylvania. And Mm -hmm. my great grandmother (laughs) was Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I used to live there. I do not live there anymore. It's how the Audrey and I met, but we, um, you know, like canning is a huge cultural practice. Mm -hmm. And so many of the recipes in your book also call on these PA Dutch practices. So I really, I felt cozy reading it. (laughs) from that. (laughs) Oh, that's good. That's good. When we went to the Kutztown fair, I would, get my my sister and I we'd each often get a little doll and it was a mass produced plastic doll but dressed in Amish clothing i know she had one in purple with a black apron and i had one in a green dress and like little bonnet and a black apron um but you couldn't take the hoods off because they would have like a little bit of hair in front of the hood and then if you pulled the hood mm-hmm. back there was no hair on the rest of the doll's head but i don't know if those were <laughs> amish made or they were just made in hong kong for the amish tourist trade i don't know hmm. i'd like yeah, to think that it was the little clothes were hand stitched that um, would, that but would food wise up. i yeah i think so we but food wise we always had at the kutztown fair um a waffle so it was one square waffle with a fat slice of Neapolitan ice cream and another square waffle on top. Yeah, Ooh, those are my husband's good. favorite. That's what he, yeah, he's, he was born and raised here in York County. So Pennsylvania Dutch <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> is, is pretty, it runs pretty deep within his side of the family. And that is like one of his favorites. Like he has to get it whenever we go to one of these festivals or fairs. Like that is the one thing he has to get that and ham and cheese sandwiches. <laughs> Ham and cheese sandwiches. And I love shoe fly pie. I love to eat it. Oh, yeah. I can't bring myself to make it because it's basically butter and sugar in there, right? Molasses. Just all like sugar. So yeah, molasses. much molasses. Yeah. yeah. It's so good. Like I, vanilla ice cream on the side. Mm-hmm. Wet bottom or dry bottom? I don't know if you have come across I don't that. Know. Yeah, there is a it difference. Was, there. What's the wet bottom? Wet I'm bottom's sure. the better one. <laughs> in okay. My okay. It's the stickier kind. Like you, you can't get it off the plate. That's the difference. Oh, basically. Dry bottom has had a it. lot more flour. Gotcha. Okay. I've had dry bottom. I haven't had wet bottom. Yeah. That's yet. the one they usually sell because it lasts longer. Because a wet bottom mm-hmm. truly just, the molasses disintegrates what little bits of crust there are. 
but it's oh it's delicious especially mm. a, little, a little warmed up just a few minutes a few seconds in the microwave mm. yeah oh now i'm getting homesick <laughs> and and like this is food people's like oh that's so, so heavy but like this is food for people who work Ex- no exactly yes, exactly mm-hmm. if you eat an amish diet and don't live an amish life prepare for, for yeah. like pre-diabetes for that would be a problem it's not gonna go well for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> And actually, I wondered about that. What were some of your favorite sources that you came across for for PA Dutch recipes? Um, okay, there's a book. I mean, I didn't delve too deeply for the Moravian, the whole Moravian cookies and Moravian connection. There's no recipe for Moravian cookies because they're just too thin. It's too hard. Um I did use the internet a lot and all the websites, if anybody wants to, you know, follow my path, the websites are there, but there's also um, a book and I'm looking back on my bookshelf, American Cake by, by, I can't see the author from here. It's Anne something, Anne Byrne. Um, American Cake is great, mm-hmm. not just for Pennsylvania Dutch, but for um, the history of American baking. She goes deep. Yeah. And people like don't, we've lost a lot of that tradition in American baking. We've lost a lot of the ingredients, things that people don't use anymore, like dried currants, a lot of the spices. um, Yeah. So we've, there's, there was a richness there that's been lost. And um, I knew a little bit about it because I used to, we used to have tea and tours at the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts where I was a docent. And one year, one year I led the tours on Sundays and another year I got to bake the cakes and they can't, I wish I could remember. They sent me like home with like photocopies of, of traditional recipes, you know, in modern terms. And um, I made a, a current cake one time that had like a ton of butter and a ton of cream. And there was an, older man at the tea and tour and he's like well if this won't give you a heart attack i don't know what will Mm -hmm. but again this was a cake for people who Who work who worked yes with their hands with their bodies all day long and this was it was a special occasion cake so that was something they would have eaten at a wedding or at christmas so yeah you're gonna put all the rich stuff in it and actually on that note of the american cookbook history you talk a little bit about the mysterious melinda russell could you yeah. share a bit about who she was with our listeners because that was one of my favorite like nuggets of wisdom in your book okay she was so she belonged to the tradition which as i was writing this book i realized that i belong to where your um she was a single mother i think her husband had died she had a disabled son. I don't know how disabled. So she needed to support him. What did she know how to do? She knew how to bake and cook. So she wrote this cookbook. I'm forgetting the years. I'm bad with years. It was shortly after the Civil War and Melinda Russell uh, was I black. Have it here, 1862. Yeah. So, the, so, so yeah, Civil War. It's during Civil War. She she was black. I think she was free. I don't think she had been enslaved herself. Um, and she learned, she names the cook who taught her most of what she knew, who we believe, Fanny, I forget Fanny's last name. Um, she probably was enslaved, the cook that she learned from. And... Um, no, Melinda did not. the The book was almost lost. Melinda died, we think, still young. Um, it's mysterious because we don't really know what happened to her. And it was like one. There was a fire. One copy was left, and you know, recently, you know, black historians discovered it, dug it out, and um, so now we know about it. And you can now read the whole thing. I think you can read the whole thing online. Um, I hope somebody digs up more about her. I don't know. We could maybe put Henry Louis Gates on the case to find (laughs) out (laughs) if anybody can find it. He can. But she was part of that whole tradition of um, Hannah Glass and Sarah Josepha Hale, women who 
oh my God, I have these kids to feed. I have no formal education. No one's going to take me seriously. Right. Oh, but people have to eat and I know how to cook and I know how to write. I'm going to write a cookbook. Mm. It's powerful. Yeah. That's the kind of kitchen magic that we, that really ties it back to what we try to teach here is yeah. like, we, it's so important to find empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, in the case of Sarah Josepha Hale, who is more famous as she's the one who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh, okay. She wrote oh, okay. a, a, yeah, she wrote a cookbook and she had little to no formal education, but she had an older brother who was going to college and he would bring home the books and share the books with her. And so that's how she got her education. And then I think I can't remember if she was widow, but she was, she found herself in a position where, and she probably learned cooking from her father to a great degree because he had, he ran a tavern. Oh, okay. So there are there are a lot of good guys in these yes. stories too. <laughs> I, I love that how cooking it it's so instrumental to our culture, our way of life, and traditions like Christmas and baking and that sort of thing, and the history. But going into the idea that it again the communal idea. And how it filters through everything. We have this idea like, oh, it's, you know, I think nowadays we think of baking as more of that solitary practice where, you know, someone's in the kitchen, they're doing their baking thing, and then they serve it up to their family. It's same with cooking. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when we look, I love how we look back and see how this was, it was so communal. It was, you know, empowering to, to individuals who had nothing else. So they resorted to baking and cooking and and sharing that with the world. I love it. Because every yeah, everybody needs to eat. That yes. so that helps. That's the <laughs> universal thing. And yeah, you're right. Like we often cooking is is one person doing it. Oh, a bald eagle just flew past my window. Awesome. Wow. That's oh, amazing. I've never seen a bald eagle here before. Wow. Okay. I hope I see him again. Wow, that yeah. was cool. Um <laughs> yeah. so but yeah, at Christmas time, like None of us bake alone. I made Lebkuchen right. yesterday because we have um, our town's book fair is on Saturday. And um, and that's always a little dodgy for me because I'm making those Christmas smell, smells in the kitchen before yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, my son was present in the kitchen. Did he help? Usually he's right up in it. <laughs> He ate the end pieces, you know, when I okay. when I cut it up and put it in the tin. So yeah, but we with Christmas baking, nobody does it alone. Like my mom is in her eighty now, so she needs an assistant. So it's like, um, you know, when can somebody come over to help me grind the nuts? Um, and yeah, it's all it's all communal. My my daughter, she's she's she was single for a long time, so she was you know baking alone but mm -hmm. she still did it she even though she's on the other she was in philadelphia for a long time now she's in new mexico um she was alone in her own kitchen but she was making our family recipes and you know we'd get called my mother would get calls my mother's the one you call what do i do why did this happen mm -hmm. why isn't it coming out of the pan <laughs> <laughs> so it, it keeps you together and she even made she remembered my friend in high school, her mom was Greek and her mom would make, there were two cookies and I always forget which is which. There's curambieres was one oh, of them. Yeah. There was, is that the one with the clove in the middle or the one that's just like a sweet? It's honey. It's like a. It's the honey. Okay. So the honey one. Yeah, lots of honey. And then what's the one with the clove in the middle? Oh, that's a, that's a big vast subject <laughs> there are a okay, lot so of it's, what, it's like a rectangle it's a triangular cookie and it's a very it's a very buttery dough and then it's mm, it a ton of powdered like sugar on top probably oh. and probably i couldn't pronounce that and that's why i never learned the name <laughs> and then well, and we have you always like say a, a, yeah there's like a broad like, category of kularaikia that's like a super buttery dough and then you put like an egg wash on top it might have been in that family of like the, you know, everybody has their own regional 
twist to it. Yeah, so I don't know if I had the egg wash, in that but region. it's always like take the take the clove out before you eat the cookie. That's always the <laughs> the caution. Um, so, so she remembered my high school friend, you know, when she was very little, my high school friend still coming over, um, with those clove cookies and, um, yeah, we do always take the clove out, but, um, I read in, what's the name of it? It's over here. So in the taste of conquest, he goes to the Netherlands and in there they have, uh, you can buy cheese that's got cloves in it and you just chew right through the cloves. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So the Dutch have yeah. a very high spice threshold. I have bitten into a clove and had it stuck in my tooth for a long time. And uh, yeah. so that is this really unappealing to me. <laughs> <laughs> Although they say like clove is good for toothache. So it really is. Yeah. I, I yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like we think of spice as hot, but clove is a cold spice. That's yeah, a cold it hot. Is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it'll numb. It just, it's very topically numbing. So it'll numb mm -hmm. any pain you might have, <laughs> which is yeah, why it's used yeah. in toothaches and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I put it in my, my sore throat tea blend. Yeah. The licorice root and slippery elm. It helps me get my, like, I get that persistent tickly cough. So yeah, clove is so good. Real talk. Leandro and I could be trying to sell you socks or a VPN or that cereal everybody talks about, but we like to keep it witchy around here instead. And we can only do that because of the support of listeners like you. When you're joining my Magical Living community on Patreon, you're not only getting weekly shadow work journal prompts, new moon and full moon rituals, exclusive videos, exclusive meditations, plus bonus episodes of the Magic Kitchen podcast. But you're seriously keeping the lights on in the Magic Kitchen. Thank you for listening and reviewing the show. And if you're ready to meet me in the Magic Kitchen, pop over to patreon.com slash Elise Wells and start your free trial. Let's deepen your magical practice together. Oh, and speaking of Greek food, so the same friend her mother would make every year a Greek New Year's bread. And oh, I think it yeah. had Spiky. orange peel, I th spices, orange peel, might have had some you know, ground clove, and she would put a quarter in it. Oh. Yes. Yeah, we do that every we're... year. It's, it's, it's got, I don't know if she could get this in the US, but in, in Greece, we use mastika or mastic as the essence oh. the flavor. Like, you know, like in the States, we might use like vanilla essence or we might use, but you use essence of mastic. In and what is mastic? New Year's bread. Is it a so, resin? It's exactly, it's a resin from specifically a tree that grows on Chios on an island. Um, it's spelled like Chios, C-H-I-O-S in English. Um, mm -hmm. And that's it. Like that's the place that makes it. But you can also yeah. get a similar resin from a bush-like tree that grows oh. all over Greece. Um, so so there and are is the local traditions that tree, use that themselves. Is it an evergreen? Um, it In a sense, I guess it would fit into that Maybe. Well, it's, so it's not, it's not, you know, needly, but the leaves stay mm -hmm. on it all year and they don't okay. change and they never fall. So, and is it the sap? Is the mastic the sap? Yeah. They'll like, they'll almost collect it like you would maple syrup. Oh, like you would tap the tree to get it, but it's, but it's a low level tree. It's a different kind. It's even olive trees are kind of small looking like an, an old, old mm -hmm. olive tree. Like I've met a 600 year old olive tree before. But it's 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 still short. It was only maybe a foot taller than me. Um, mm -hmm. Mastic grows similarly. It's kind of like stout, almost shrub like. Like if you see the varieties that aren't cultivated for harvest, like the wild ones, they're just like little shrubs. You have to get up close to recognize like, oh, yeah, that is a tree. It's just small. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, it's got a kind of licorice flavor. I mm -hmm. actually I don't like it. It's OK in savories. Like if you if you put it actually, they make like a a seltzer water with it. That's not bad. And they also make a liquor, like a liqueur um, out of it. Everything's always just called mastica. So if you ask for mastica, mastica. Like, well, what do you mean? Do you want gum? 
do you want bread do you want ice cream do you want soda um <laughs> but yeah it's uh it's, it's like, like a, a you know in the states we have like vanilla chocolate strawberry like in Greece, it's vanilla, chocolate, mastika. Like that's that third flavor. Interesting. But it's traditional at New Year's and Christmas time. I wonder, I wonder if it's related to myrrh. Because myrrh is mystica fragrance or myr- myrstica mm. fragrance. And that's it might from a tree. It truly be the same tree. I honestly, it could be. It could be maybe a variety that's edible. Maybe it's like a male, female tree thing. That makes one more edible than the other. Uh, I wrote an I'm article on fr- wrote an article on frankincense years ago for the Llewellyn Herbal Almanac, and um, they think that the the frankincense, gold, and myrrh that the three kings brought to the baby Jesus that the gold because frankincense is from a tree, myrrh is from a tree, and the gold was from another kind of evergreen another resin from another evergreen maybe some kind of balsam and frankincense you can eat too you can chew it yeah and myrrh you you can um you shouldn't eat a whole lot of it but myrrh used to be used for treating cold sores ah yeah they would suck on it to treat the the cold sores inside the mouth or mouth ulcers Hmm. yeah yeah, they would chew it like, and I think, you know, like in maybe in Yemen and and um, Southern Arabia, they still chew it like a like a chewing gum, almost as a in lieu for brushing teeth. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, so in the in the book, um, uh, Vivette, who I mentioned in the book about the fruit cake, and also she gave yes, me her yeah. Mia, Mia cake recipe. She lived in Saudi Arabia for a few years in the nineteen seventies. And oh it God, sounds like it that. was a whole different world. She said, so they lived on, um, I don't know if it was Exxon. Her husband was an engineer. So they were living, I think, in company company housing. Mm-hmm. But she on said she could, yeah, she could look out her window. She bought a rug from a woman because it, there was, um, you know, Bedouins that she could see from her window. And she had watched this woman make weave this rug. And when it was finished, she went out and she said, could she buy it? And and she bought it. And she learned, um, she was like, Vivette was, she was amazing. She learned enough Arabic that she could haggle in the marketplace. And she said oh, wow. one time she was, she needed to buy thread. And the woman in front of her was charged one price. And then when she gets up, he gives, mm-hmm. it was, an, um, you know, Saudi woman charged one price, price Vivette foreigner gets up there he charges her you know five times more she's well you i'm only Mm going to pay what that woman there paid she says in arabic so yeah she got she got good deals there but and yeah she had that hasn't changed (laughs) that hasn't changed (laughs) oh no she had a picture on her it's the same yeah she had a picture on her wall of like a street that looked it looked to me like um like old streets in New Mexico look now like an old adobe house, you know, dirt road, small adobe house, um, wooden fence. And so, yeah, I think it's, that's, I think pretty much gone. No. And replaced by Starbucks. It's like, it's like that in the centers. And then you'll just leave the centers of like Jeddah or Riyadh or these bigger cities. And then all of a sudden there you are back in like the late 19th century. It is pretty wild. And actually, what I was going to say to like bring it back to baking is they still make all the same traditional old recipes the way they would have. So you can actually still like, even for pita, like you'll still see them use a wood firing oven for their pita. Mm-hmm. Like the big, I don't know if you've seen like an Arabic oven, like they're massive They're They take like an no, Italian pizza oven and they mm-hmm. dwarf them. And the pita wow. is huge too. It's like very thin and it's, the diameter is maybe 14 inches across and it's super soft. Like it's unlike anything like the Gulf has a very different pita. Even each region has its own pita, but the Bahraini and Saudi pita is like amazing. Um, but they, and then do they, they make still, it like as a business or is it like a whole village making it? Now it's done originally, like you would have, cause the compound structure 
is is the same that it would have been in Western Europe, except in this case, it's like mandatory. But you would have like a community bakery that you would go to to get what you need or bring your own things to be made in that oven. So now it's different where like you just go and buy the pita from the guy, but it is subsidized by the government. So it's very affordable. Like for 30 cents, you can get like seven or eight pitas. And this is a region that's it's quite expensive to live in the Middle East today. So it's kind of funny that you can still get pita at like, you know, wood fire prices. <laughs> that's nice. She also had yeah. a wooden mold. It was kind of like a spoon, but it had a geometric design like in the bowl of the spoon. It was thick wood. And something mm. she said, some some kind of pastry was made. And like they would press the dough in and then turn it out and bake it mm. but i don't know what it was that's clever yeah yeah the kind i look like it maybe the product would be something like a moon cake with the um you know the design pressed on top yeah actually that's something that struck me in your book is how many of the design how many of the baked goods had some design that was important for its like that yeah. made it the cake you know like what was mm -hmm. the one that was in a painting the pic I can't remember what the um oh the, the the duva duva carta yes mm -hmm. yes that one yeah it's beautiful right and um you would would cut it and it looked like they also maybe took some some dough and made sort of like applique of other figures on there and then glazed it all with with egg to make it shiny because it was a special occasion thing. I guess if you're going to put all those expensive ingredients, what was expensive at that time, you know, eggs and cream and butter, you got to make it, might as well make it look good. Yeah, make it beautiful. Yeah. And the the professional bakers would have absolutely, you know, they were artisans. They were artists, too, with all that they could do. Yeah, that actually really is something that struck me is how few of these recipes I would even dare attempt because I just am not... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like, okay, one, I don't have an oven now. So that makes it quite tricky. But mm -hmm. even when I did have an oven, like I know my limits, like I have a few marks, like I'd like to try to make speculus. I know the Dutch name, like speculus. Yeah. yeah so um, how do you so actually yeah, specu say it? Speculos, speculos. I think because uh, the some Emily who I um, interviewed about it, she's Belgian. So she Belgian and French. So she mm. called it speculos. Um, I know it as yeah. speculatius, which is the German um, name, which comes more directly from the Latin, mm. meaning mirror, because it's a mirror image of the picture on the mold. Yeah, I, I have once I have attempted like the art, like the really artistic bread, and it was mm -hmm. bread that was it was um, like rolled and twisted and cut to look like uh, wheat shafts, and. That, oh yeah nice. that was fun but oh my gosh it took me all day <laughs> I have a there's a fairly for it <laughs> there's a fairly easy thing that looks impressive where you take um like i've made it with almond filling i used um like the recipe for a finished cardamom bread and but i rolled it out i rolled the dough out and then i rolled marzipan in it. So we rolled it up into a long log and then you bend it into a circle. So you have a ring and then with scissors, you cut, you snip, you make cuts yeah. into the outside of the yeah, ring, right. not yeah. all the way through. And then you pull, you pull each cut and you turn it like flat. So you end up oh, with this, I've these like this. radiating. It's almost like braided. Yeah, it's braided, but it's like these these discs that are yeah one on top of the other. So it, it it looks it looks harder. It looks like it was harder to make than it actually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get pretty clever. That yeah, that's how I would make them wheat shafts. I would clip them so that they would look jagged, and it, it was fun. But yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a deep appreciation for people who can bake and make it look, you know, artistic and make it look the way it's supposed to. <laughs> I remember. Oh, One yeah. year, my sister was always a lone baker. Um, she would go rogue. She would go her own way. <laughs> and I remember one year, and she was more ambitious. She didn't bake a lot, but if she baked, she was gonna, she was gonna go full on. And I remember getting up, like for school, 
in high school one morning, like shortly before Christmas, and she's got these these whole wheat, like glazed and sugared teddy bears that she has made. I don't know what time she got up in the morning just to give to all her friends. They're these little, little whole wheat teddy bear breads. It's amazing. Oh my gosh. And yeah, that was, you know, like the ears of, I think I have raisins for eyes. And um, yeah, and she was, I, I find her, I have her cookbooks and she was always cutting the sugar. Like she'll, I, she'll cross it, you know, say two cups sugar and she'll cross out and write one and a quarter cups sugar. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. So I usually add the sugar <clears throat> back in because <laughs> I like it. <laughs> like the sugar, yeah. Oh, man. I think one, of, the, one of my yeah, favorite parts of your book was the Bafana and the broomstick. I'm, you know, I kept looking it over. I'm like, oh, I love, I want to make it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I'm not like, so hard yeah. to make. No, yeah, she's not so hard to make. The broomstick is harder than the bafana. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, but if you use small enough paper, you could also use a like a party toothpick. You know, with the gotcha. yeah, mm-hmm, you could use that if you you make nice. her small enough. Yeah, yeah. I like that you included not just recipes, but things we can do with paper. Yes. Actually, I have all of those marked: the paper star, the, paper ones, the little yeah. paper plates. Yeah, that I do. Paper crafts, I do love to do. I need to do. I, I love doing, you know, making new Christmas ornaments, coming up with like new design. I'm always playing with paper. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of like something we can add to our tradition of making snowflakes, you know, like make up a, mm-hmm. a bafana to hang in the window with those oh, snowflakes. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you need a kitchen witch, if you need a nice little yeah. kitchen witch. Your little bafana. Mm-hmm. There she and, is. and I love to like, you know, witches can do all of the activities in your book with their secular or Mm -hmm. other religious family members and friends, you know, like it really, your book is a, this book is a great reminder as I'm sure the old magic of Christmas is too. I'm excited to read that next. It's kind of read them out of order, I suppose. Um, (laughs) Oh, oh, you you haven't read all that's that's refreshing because the old magic of Christmas is just a little, a little bit become the book that I, I resent. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Oh no, why? Because um like it's like I wrote that book and and then I've I have written things since then and they just you know usually 99% of the interview requests I get are for old magic of christmas and I'm like I've already said everything that I have to say about that so um <laughs> it's refreshing that you have not read it. <laughs> Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that brings me to a question um, I had. Your your research for this book was incredible. So did you? It was a lot. Exactly. I can't imagine. Like, and yet I also uh, feel it wasn't enough. I also feel it wasn't enough. because. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Is there so anything big. you researched about this subject that you didn't in the end have room to include like maybe a rabbit hole you started on that you couldn't fit into this book that you could share with us? Oh, so many rabbit holes. So, I mean, there should have been more Mm -hmm. about the triangle trade of, you know, but, but I figured there are books written about that of the um, Mm -hmm. trying to remember the order. Like, so they would make the sugar in the Caribbean, you know, grow and process the sugar in the Caribbean. And then the molasses, would often be shipped up north and then but it's slaves were always one corner of that triangle you you yeah. buy the slaves to plant and to grow the sugar and process the sugar and then you sell those products so that you can buy more slaves to process more sugar and um one thing that i learned was that it was slave labor, but it was not unskilled labor. Well, in my mind, there really yeah. isn't anything. There is no such thing as unskilled labor because any any kind of job, once you've been doing it for a while, you, have a skill. you get good at it. And other people, like if even if it's just like spreading salt on the road, if you've been doing it for years, you're going to be better than somebody who's never done it before. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, but this was because the Arabs had started both the tradition of not just the Arabs, but the, you know, the Islamic 
emperor empires, um, you know, in, in Morocco, in North Africa, in the Middle East, and then in Spain, they started, um, you know, growing sugar on a grander scale than it had been before. And with that came, they needed slaves. So they had trained in West Africa. There were slaves who had been trained you know, already knew, you know, how to grow sugar, how to process sugar, because it's complicated and it's sugar is very finicky and and fragile and it's time sensitive. So the slaves who were shipped over there, many of them already knew this whole industry. They weren't just, you know, like here, plant seeds, cut, cut cane. It was, it's, it's a skill that they, they were, they were skilled labor and also unpaid and and work to death. Yeah. And I, I appreciated that throughout your book, you don't gloss over right. the dark side. Yeah. That whole dark side of Christmas baking and the sugar trade. And mm-hmm. yeah, I thought that was important because we've have forgotten and we it's, it's not just like, Oh, this is a deep dark secret in the past that everybody's forgotten about, you know, why mar the, the current happy traditions, you know, with, with remembering that it's because it's still, we're still absolutely feeling the effects. Yes. Mm-hmm. And those, those structured systemic ways of prospering are still the foundational ways that the West prospers today. You know, we don't call it slavery. Mm-hmm you know, but they're prisoners of war in China. And why are they prisoners? Mm, Well, because they're Muslim, you know, like the Uyghurs Mm -hmm. are making all of these clothes people buy from Shine or Temu or all these horrible Facebook ads we get for $1.99 handmade this and that, you know, it's the same thing today. Like when we buy that ugly Christmas sweater for five bucks from Wish, we're supporting slavery just like our ancestors did. (laughs) And when we get, when you get a new computer, when you get a new iPhone, there's, yeah. you know, kids having to dive into that smoking trash heap to get, get the materials that they're going to sell to the people who make the electronics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. like such an important cornerstone of like our podcast. We're always reminding people your money is your vote for human rights. Your money is your morality. Like, you know, just, just, oh, especially with the holiday season, people just buy so much stuff that just ends up in landfills and had a sad story to begin with. And, and mm-hmm. if we could just return to, like, I, I always see it go around, but I don't know how many people are doing it because I have yet to receive this as a gift, but people are like, let's normalize giving handwritten recipes as gifts yeah. instead of, yeah, you know, or yeah, I have done that. Or, yeah, it's better. Like That's I did that idea. one year. People truly thought I cheaped out. I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> or I needed things and people were like, oh, you could have bought me this at five below, yeah. you know? And that's like, one of the on. traditions I started many years ago was I make biscotti every year. That's the one recipe oh. I do for everybody. And that's really the only time I bake. Like I'm not a baker. I'm I'm a cook. <laughs> I'll cook until mm-hmm. the cows come home, but I'm not much of a baker, but I make biscotti from, from scratch. And so I make these huge batches and that's the one thing I give everybody in, you know, the gifts gifts from me that I can think, you know, if, if I can think of you, I give you biscotti. <laughs> and, <Aww. sighs> and, you know, it, and nice. I have people now they, they realize like, okay, that's the gift she's going to give. And they ask for it. Like my father-in-law loves them. He can't wait for them every single year. He can't wait to get the biscotti. (laughs) That's one thing I'd love to eat and I've never made. They're they're Mm. time consuming, but they're not hard. And you can make a bunch at one time. Yeah, you can make two huge loaves and get dozens of cookies out of it, depending on how thick you cut them. And yeah, it's the twice baking that takes the amount of time. And the recipe I I have modified for myself, it it's one of those things where like I've done it for so many years and I've tried so many other different recipes. I'm like, okay, this is the one that works for me. So, you know, it's like it's got like 12 eggs in it and it's it's a lot, but <laughs> do you put chocolate on the bottom? I sometimes I will, but usually it's just the straight biscuit. 
and then with with chunks of the almond in it and they're very almond um i do one for my husband that is it's a chocolate dough so i'll add cocoa to it but it's mainly just um almond and sometimes some chocolate chips in there but chocolate dough is tricky because when you put that cocoa powder in it it can make it dry it can yeah but yeah. it's got that you want it dry. You want it to be You want dry. it right. Yeah, because then you, because once you bake it once, you have to slice it and then you bake it again to dry them out completely. That's the tricky part. Um, I was just talking to Elise earlier, like my oven is so bad. I need a new oven. <laughs> like it does not brown anything. It it holds on. I don't know what it does, but like it, it just, the moisture in it is too much. So no thing hmm. ever really dries out. So I literally have to like crack my oven and I wait for hours. <laughs> so uh, it's like, it's this labor of love, I guess. <laughs> is it a gas or is it electric? It's electric oven. and I hate it. Electric. I really hate it. <laughs> One of these days I will replace it. One of these days. <laughs> I thought it was fascinating when I, when I interviewed Nev March about um, her, she's not Christian. She's um, Zoroastrian, but she had Christian neighbors in Bombay, in Mumbai. And um, how they baked cookies. The oven is this little thing that you only take down off the shelf huh. when you want to bake cookies. Oh, oh wow. And then you That's stuff so it. She's like, you stuff everything you can because you don't, you've got a gas canister to oh. fuel it and you don't want to waste that yeah. um, gas on it. Yeah. So we're really spoiled that we have an oven like just right there <laughs> really? in the kitchen all the time. And I feel bad like when I heat up you know, like two pieces of pizza and I turn on the whole, it's a small oven, but still. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, so we've started heating up pizza in the frying pan. Yeah. My husband swears by that method. It just closed the lid. Yeah. Because it's so different, but it does work. And I don't have a microwave. Um, If we're heating up um, pretty much any kind of meal, I put it in a water bath. I have a big um, enamel pot. Just put a little bit of water in the bottom, put the food in a bowl inside it and put the lid on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Huh. yeah I, I did that the other day because I didn't, cause we have a microwave, but we don't use it. I don't like using it. It's actually in the basement. So it's not mm-hmm. really accessible. And my son was like, well, I want to warm this up. I'm like, okay, here you, here you go. Here's how you do it. And he's like, I don't want to do it that way. I'm like, well, then go use the microwave. <laughs> You know, have this whole conversation of, you know, convenience, I guess. And I'm, he's like, but I don't want to go to the basement. I'm like, well, then do it this way. <laughs> we got um, our school, um, my kids' high school, they, uh, the band sells um, pizza and cheesecake every year. I think they didn't have the pizza this year. I was disappointed. And it's like a, if the pizza is all ready to go, you just have to heat it up. And it says on there. Something like if you put this in the microwave, we know, we'll know and we'll find you. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> anything doughy in the microwave just doesn't work. Microwaves are for popcorn. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Literally, that's but the even only that. Reason we use our microwave is for the popcorn, but not even that. We got an we have an air air popper, so we don't use the microwave for popcorn. I was gonna so say I use my air popper oh. more now, but and then can you put butter on it when it comes out? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I do like this. Is my, I don't know if this is gross, but I do like that olive oil spray on my popcorn, like a little bit of ah. it. And then I add uh-huh. flavorings. And one of my friends, shout out Kristen, if you're listening, she recommended um, mar- masala spices, like that, that Indian spice blend you Ooh. can buy. Oh, mm-hmm. it's so good. A little bit of salt, a little bit of mas- masala oh, cool. spice. It is super good on popcorn. I'll try that. I have some in my cupboard. I'll have to try that. <laughs> yeah, it's good and masala is not spicy for those listening it's like it's warm it's not actually like hot spicy like it's not it's not peppery or anything it's probably like maybe cinnamon turmeric probably some salt yeah it's in got there. like I, spice. Masala. I think nine yeah nine spices, a lot of spices. those are in there for sure is it yellow cumin yeah kind yeah, of it's the like one i have yellow. is like a dark dark red i got mine in bahrain actually okay. from an indian store yeah mine's like an off yellow so it doesn't it probably doesn't have the paprika in it yeah oh, speaking probably, of, i have can, one that's like that with turmeric can we briefly return to bahrain or bahrain i'm trying to sure. say it right um have you read i have a book about 
um, where is it? Where is it? It's by PV Globe, who was a Danish archaeologist, but he also and he he found the Bog people. Are you familiar with the Bog people? Um, oh, like like in the UK, the Tolland man. No, well, there's some in in UK, but he. There were a lot found in Denmark. Um, one is Tolland man. He is a. Oh, he's got yes, a cap he's on. Like he was over with his hat. Yeah, yeah. He's in like in fetal position. Yeah, with his little hat, yes. and he looks. Yes. He looks. Um, I have a special attachment to him because he look totally looks like my mom's side of the family. Um, oh, <laughs> and we're from that wild. just close to that part of the world. But anyway, but oh, PV yeah. Globe, who who dug up most of the bog bodies, he also spent some time digging on Bahrain and found mm, the um, an ancient civilization there. And there's, he thinks that um, in in the Mesopotamian um, tablets, when they talk about Dilmun, which was this, you that's know, them. kind of, yeah, that's there. Mm-hmm. And that was that. They found graves with, there were graves with snakes. Snakes and pots had been laid to rest. And um, yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I need to read his book because I I know yeah. a bit more from like a firsthand. Like, I just visited the group. You were there, but unfortunately, yeah. along with the whole like I'm the king, I said build that. Uh, same goes for destruction. Like, there's really like when I was living there in 2009, you could still walk amongst the Dillman graves just in the middle of neighborhoods. You could just go out walking among them. Oh wow! And if you felt like it, you could dig into them. Like they were still there. And mm-hmm. now, since then, they have been bulldozed completely with no excavation done. And oh. they built. How horrible is that? Mm-hmm. They That's saved cool. a yeah. couple. Like, literally a couple. Like, two to four. Um, but, I mean, there were dozens. There was at least 30 that I could count from one of my brother's best friends lived in that compound. that they the, the old one that was probably on top of graves as well. But you could see from his window, like, at the top level of the house, like, just these these mouths. It was incredible. The Dillman people are so underrated because, unfortunately, they didn't do much archaeology. So they're kind and they of like to Tarjan. I guess because don't know very much. Is it because they were pre-Islamic? Um, yeah. So they're not exactly. given pre, 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 like prehistoric, really. Yeah. Because yeah, that would, you know, some I think like contemporary with Mesopotamia when that was flourishing, and they probably, mm-hmm. you know, traded with them. An exchange of ideas. And then there's the the epigraphic South Arabian writing. I love that. Have you seen? Um, there's some, it's on stone, some stone markers on some copper plates, I think. I just love the way it looks. And that's, I think, from early, like the late centuries BC. Mm. And they don't, they teach you about cuneiform in school. And then I was going to ask if it was. Linear it's not cuneiform. Maybe? It's I think it's um it's probably derived ultimately from Phoenician, the same that mm-hmm. our alphabet comes from. But it just looks funky and cool. It looks almost like space yeah. writing. It looks like alien writing. Oh, that's cool. I'll look into that. That's cool. Yeah, There's I, not yet. Yeah, the I best... like linear being cuneiform the most, but like I like that. And Nana's my patron goddess, so I really love learning about mesopotamia and sumeria is that the goddess, the goddess i hope of the moon? to visit yeah goddess yeah. of she's the daughter of the moon but she's a moon goddess and she's mm-hmm. the goddess of love fertility and war hmm. that's she's, she's actually considered <laughs> by a lot of scholars now aphrodite's ancestor so when inanna came to the west to them not really west to the you know listeners but like meaning mm-hmm. like the mediterranean from the middle east um she became aphrodite and that's why she's considered like a consort of aries in certain places because that kind of bridges the love and war aspects of inanna and aphrodite's first cults were born on cyprus which is the gateway from the east to the west um yeah oh that's a whole rabbit hole it is a rabbit <laughs> hole. i love to love stop by i love to stop by when i go to the metropolitan museum of art stop by those early cycladic figures there was those just white they're oh. so modern looking they're yeah, almost abstract, they look, like heart players. They're like yeah, very they look simple. like abstract art. Yeah, there's like the cyclotic, the cyclotic uh, couple. They're like united together, and their their arms make a heart shape. The way they're hugging uh-huh. each other. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's that's so like that's yeah. my parents' favorite gift. They give people statues of that for like weddings and stuff. 
<laughs> and there's some hedgehogs too, some pottery hedgehogs in this aquatic um, gallery at the Met. Oh, I don't know if I've seen those. Yeah, oh, they're cute. painted. They're hot pottery. They're painted. Um, I think not glazed. And actually, you cite the Penn Museum a good bit in your book. If anyone is near mm -hmm. the Penn Museum, Go it there. is an incredible oh. wealth of resource. And for Sumerian and Mesopotamian stuff, like they were the last, if I'm not mistaken, they were the actual last archaeological excavators before the, the I guess we could still say current war there. And they were, I think they were the first too. Yeah, they yeah. Because Woolley sure they Leonard well. Woolley was he was working for for the museum. Yeah, so they have a long, long history and like all those things that you've seen pictures of in books, the um the heart case with the goat, the ram's head on it, that um, diadem mm. of beaten gold aspen leaves that you know the the from the grave they excavated the grave. Uh, where all these um, harp players and serving men were were killed and put in the grave, those remains, those those pieces are there. Um, so yeah, a lot of super famous pieces, but it's not very. That museum is it's not huge, um, but it's not very well known. And they've got great stuff. And they've just got yeah. at the Met. You don't really see mummies at Penn Museum. There's the mummies. There they are, and like yeah. toes sticking out of the wrappings. <laughs> Yeah, Pennsylvania in general, the museums have a lot of oh, mummies. Cool. I don't know what that's about. Like even Reading, PA, my, my my local museum as a kid was like just we had an awesome mummy. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, he I was like, like to a see priest or something. He wasn't like you know big head honcho, but I mean, he, okay, mm -hmm. high priest head honchos of their sort for sure. But yeah, I mean, if they had the something. money to be mummified, they were they were pretty up there. Although there would have been, mm -hmm. if they, if the object was to be preserved, the poor people that were just buried in hot sand, they came through better. They were better preserved oh, than all that stuff that they were putting on them, which, um, yeah, well, talk okay, about that actually, in the book, Mummy. <laughs> yes, bring it back because you talk about, uh, what's it called, natron pods or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the natron, they had called? natron balls, baskets of natron balls in the Penn Museum. That Which were there is a leavening agent, but they didn't use it as one. They did not. They right? used it because um, it's it's uh, it sucks up moisture, so that would help keep things dry in the tomb. And I think because it did that, it would also uh, they came just think of it as just having it there was spiritually cleansing. So just putting a ball, you know, a basket of natron balls was spiritually cleansing, just to have it there. It's so fascinating. Like, I think, like, listeners are probably like, we're not talking about Christmas anymore. What are we doing? But if you read the book, you'll see. It's all, <laughs> yeah, this it's all there. <laughs> I, I love, like, yeah. how this, it, it evolves into other topics. So let's, oh, so bring it back to Yuletide. Like, tell us about Black Peter. I want to, I want our listens, listeners to get it. Okay, so, yeah, I really wanted to talk about Black Peter. I talked about him in Old Magic of Christmas. He's in... The Netherlands, and then I learned during well, um, interviewing Emily also um, in Belgium. He accompanies Saint Nicholas. He has a black face. Mm. In the I I personally think that he evolved from some older figure that you know you would smear your face with ashes either to hide from the spirits or to impersonate a spirit just kind of like saying okay i'm not me now i'm another character um but then by the time the dutch empire was you know had taken over some islands in the caribbean and they were importing slaves there um and you know running plantations he was be, they, he started to be depicted in blackface and he was dressed as like a a Spanish page, which because um, the Spain had had invaded Netherlands earlier in the in the 1600s. Um, so the Spain, the Spanish were the big baddies. So people say, oh, well, he's a Spanish page because Spain invaded us. So that's why. But no, he's in blackface. He's obviously a caricature of a sub-Saharan African. Um, and I. After I wrote about an old magic of Christmas, there then right after there was a lot of controversy. People were saying this is no longer appropriate, and I was 
one of the first podcasts, not a pod, it was a radio show. One of the first, I will not name it. One of the first radio shows I did for Old Magic of Christmas back in 2013, um, Black Peter came up and I said, yeah, he's he's a very controversial figure now. Um, a lot of people are upset that he's still he's still going strong. And the host said, oh, well, that's just silly. On to the next topic. I'm like, well, no, that's not just silly. It's um, so so he's yeah, he's a caricature. And if at a time when there were few to no black people living in the Netherlands, maybe that was OK. But now there are Dutch people who are black. There are Dutch people who are Indonesian um, and, you know, mixtures who come, you know, whose parents came from from the Caribbean and you don't want your kid to see a character of themselves. Um, so there's, but he's at the same time, he's, he's very beloved. Kids look forward to him coming. He's funny. He's like the comic relief. St. Nicholas is the, you know, solemn Bishop and black Peter is the comic relief. So they are finding the different cultures in it in, in, um, in the Caribbean, the, in the former Dutch colonies, they're coming up with with solutions. Um, okay, let's have him paint his face blue instead of black. How's that? Because often okay. the Black Peter, whoever's playing back Black Peter, you know, in the Caribbean and in northern uh, South America, is going to be black themselves. And I did see pictures online of. Um, you know, people of color in blackface, <laughs> people definitely with African ancestry in blackface. So I think um, he's like, you can't, you're not going to get rid of him because he has an appeal. And so people finding a way to accommodate this figure, to to modify it, to bring it into the 21st century. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be watching him. I'm interested to see what is the next development in yeah. the saga of Black Peter. Well, I, I like the idea that um, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, that whole idea that he's not a one-man show. It's always, you know, I, I know growing mm -hmm. up, he was always, he was it. You know, he was everything. So he was the jolly one. He was the serious one. So he was the, you know, the happy one and the punisher. But then when you start seeing these old, old tales come out, like, Krampus and Santa Claus and now Black Peter and you know all these different ones that start coming up and we're reconnecting with these old ideas that it again it goes back to community like we're not not any one of us can be the entire thing so there's more to it and I think when we start looking at how a, a, a central figure has another side either represented by another entity or another personality they you know hopefully they would go together that they would work together so i yeah i, I i'm curious too i'm gonna start keeping an eye out on black peter now <laughs> yeah and it seems like we need a dark and a light yeah we need yeah. It, there's there's a saint and he's got to have some kind of either just mischievous person or out and out monster like Krampus yeah they've got they always seem to need to come together and usually the the scary one the dark one is the most entertaining of the two yeah I'm definitely more interested in Krampus than I am you know Santa Claus <laughs> <laughs> I like um what so I, I ta talked to my mom I interviewed my mom my mom is a tough interview like, I don't know, we just have this way of like we we talk in circles and like I can't just ask her a question. I have to like tell me about Christmas Eve at your house. I can't say tell me about Connect Wulbrecht because it's yeah, I don't know. It's maddening. But anyway, it's so it came out so she there was um uh so she was growing up in northern Germany northwestern germany almost almost to the east um during and after world war ii and it was the weihnachtsmann the christmas man who came it was not saint nicholas because this is protestant country so they kind of translated into he's just a christmas man he's not a saint because we don't worship saints um and then he came with knecht ruprecht who is usually shown as a monk he might have a whip 
Um, and he would take the bad kids to you know, stuff them in a sack and take them somewhere very bad. And so my mother had to recite. There's um, Theodor Storm, North German poet. He wrote this long poem called Knecht Ruprecht. And she had to recite. It's a beautiful poem. She had to recite that in front of the Christmas tree. So she already had a bias against Knecht Ruprecht because nobody, you, you have to stand and recite the poem before you can receive your presence. So nobody likes him. Oh, <laughs> um, but she, he never... He never actually came. She never actually saw him. And she said when she was, was little, she was confused. Like when the cookies cookies would show up on the plate in the morning, like was which, if it was the Weihnachtsmann or Knecht Ruprecht who, who brought them, she was confused about that. But it was definitely the Weihnachtsmann who came Christmas Eve because that was her. Um, there were not a lot of men in the apartment because this is World War II, but there was one uh one of her friends had a father living there so he would play the the Vinox one and he would come in person and um and she was terrified of him i mean he's a nice guy he's dressed in you know he's dressed nicely in this nice robe and he's coming to bring you presents but she was terrified and um, i think when she was like two and a half her mother said she hid under the under the sheet that they would put over the table that had the christmas tree on it <laughs> Which is not unusual. I think a lot of like I was there's a, I have a picture of um, my sister and I are sitting on a mall Santa's lap and I'm yeah. screaming I was and she's looking that. like, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. How many of us were terrified of the mall? Terrified. Because <laughs> he's not normal looking. No, no. <laughs> hmm. or I was so in the minority. I looked forward to Santa all year and I would like. Literally, I, I guess I would ask him for what I want, but I just remember being so excited to like get my picture taken. Like, oh, I don't know. Man. I just loved yeah. the whole aesthetic of it. I hated it. <laughs> it's like what they called in, in Hinduism, darshan, when they bring, um, like they bring the statue out of the temple and you want to make eye contact with the statue. And that's called darshan. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, I think a lot of kids want that darshan with Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and some yeah, of us don't want it at all. <laughs> Look at me, Santa. So, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I have one last question and we'll finish mm -hmm. finish off here on this one. Um, so this is candy making, not necessarily baking, but candy canes. When and why are they Christmassy? And why peppermint? Like what like I didn't even see peppermint in your book. no yeah um, i didn't go so i didn't go really um i did so yeah because i well my I was excuse wondering if leaving, you came across all this i have yeah. come across that my excuse is because it's oh well that's definitely candy making so i don't have to cover that right, right. um and it didn't yeah. really fit it, like i followed a few main paths like marzipan gingerbread stone um so and it was not on any of those routes i think i may have heard that they originated in canada that they were originally just oh. white sticks of candy and somebody had the idea to bend them into a cane because, um, you know, Jesus as the shepherd. Yeah, that's what I heard. That too, it was shepherd. Yeah. Yeah. Reinforce how they why peppermint. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that one. Um, I have, but I have also a friend of mine who um, he used to used to have a tour company in Iceland, and he's he travels in Scandinavia a lot, and he sent me for Christmas these Swedish peppermint sticks. So they were they were fatter than your average candy cane. They were not in a cane; they were just sticks, but they were peppermint flavored, and they were red and white striped. So if they adopted that from america or if that was a swedish custom that then merged with the candy cane in the new world i don't know but it's an intriguing question isn't it yeah because that's the only peppermint thing yeah 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 exactly all right so yeah. we'll put that out to the listeners yeah if you know the answer mm -hmm. please no. email us <laughs> message us on instagram whatever because i'm curious and we'll share the answer if anyone has it um absolutely on a i would love episode. to know I am I am fascinated by that. <laughs> All right. Well, could you thanks for being here. Yeah. And thanks you for having our me. listeners where they get the secret history of Christmas baking, the old magic of Christmas, any of your books, and how to stay connected with you. 
Okay, I think you can get the book pretty much anywhere online. You can get it directly from Llewellyn. You can uh, read it as an ebook. Um, I don't know if you can get it in stores. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure if you go to your bookstore, they can order it for you. I don't, I've never like, I've never been in a Barnes and Noble and seen my book on the shelf, any of my books. Um, uh, and how to stay connected with me. Um, Instagram is just Instagram at Linda Radish. And um, yeah, that's me. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for being here. And thanks for having me. Have a wonderful Yuletide season. Yes. I will. Cool. I definitely will. Because no more research. I don't have to do any research this year. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. all for fun now. <laughs> I can just enjoy. Wait, before we go. So what do you, what is, what are you looking forward to baking this year if you're going to bake? Um, well, I already made that one batch of Lebkuchen. Lebkuchen has become, even though it was not my favorite as a kid, that's not my favorite. And I'm still tweaking. I'm still experimenting with the recipe. So more Lebkuchen adventures awesome. this season. All right. Well, thank you. That's awesome. awesome. Merry meet, merry part, and, and merry meet, meet again. again. Thank you for joining us on the Magic Kitchen podcast. Please visit my website, leandrawitchwood.com, for news, information, and more episodes. I'm Elise Wells, and I can be found at Seeking Numina on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and seekingnumina.com. That's seeking, N-U-M-I-N-A. N-U-M-I-N-A.